I want to read verse 1 down to verse 4. John tells us, After these, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude, verse 2, followed him because they saw the miracles, or his miracles, which he did on them which were diseased. And so Jesus went into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. I wonder if you have ever thought, does God know what I'm going through? Does God care about what I'm going through? Does God really want to deliver me in my plight and in my problems? And if that's ever been an experience that you've had, this story of the feeding of the 5,000 tonight is for you. It's the only miracle, as I mentioned, that Jesus record, that John recorded, excuse me, and all the other Gospels recorded, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it's the only miracle Jesus performed that's recorded in all four Gospels and is full of important lessons for us to learn of trust and faith and dependence and looking to Jesus. Now, these lessons are basic, but they're not, they're not elementary or light. They're super deep and important lessons that we all must learn. But perhaps you look at your problems and your abilities to meet the problem are very small, but you forgot to look at Jesus and consider His resources. I like this story because it talks about the sufficiency of Christ. When we go through a problem, we don't have the sufficient strength. We don't have the sufficient wisdom. We, we don't have the ability to deal with those problems. So many problems that we face are beyond our ability to deal with. So we have to learn our lesson to trust God and to put our, hand, put our, put our lives in His hands. Now, in verses 1 to 4 that we just read, we have the context of the miracle or the setting or the background for the miracle. We see the place, we see the people who were involved around the miracle, and then we look at the time. Go back with me to verse 1. It says, after these things, after what things? Well, obviously after chapter 5 where Jesus had healed the man at the pool of Bethesda and uh, he had given the teaching about the Scriptures and their importance, so Jesus has been in Jerusalem in chapter 5. And chapter 6, there's a bit of a gap between 5 and 6. We now move from Jerusalem in the south to Galilee in the north. Now a couple of little bits of information. You begin what's known as the last year of the life of Christ. And he's in the heart of what is known as his Galilean ministry. Now so much of that ministry is not recorded by John. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, and it's in Luke. But we're in the last one year period of the life of Christ. The Passover is the Passover before the Passover that Jesus will be crucified. But he goes from the south and Judea to Jerusalem, and he heads north up to the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus went over, verse 1, the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Sea of Tiberius. Now, when it says there that Jesus went over, it is a clear reference to the fact that he got in a boat with his disciples and he crossed over the Sea of Galilee. Now, it's believed, and I think rightfully so, that he was on the western shore of Galilee. Now, you need to familiarize yourself a little bit with a map, and we won't turn there now, and I don't want to get too distracted by the geography of the Holy Land, but in the back of just about every Bible, if you don't have one in your Bible, then you got gypped when you bought your Bible. You need to buy a Bible with a map in the back. It should have a map in the time of Christ. And you'll see the Sea of Galilee. It's a pear-shaped freshwater lake, and it's about 13 miles long, and in its widest point, about eight miles wide. It's not really a sea in our standards today. It's a lake. But uh, from the base of Mount Hermon, fresh waters come streaming down into the lake. It's a beautiful freshwater lake teeming with fish, beautiful blues in the sunshine. And then out the south end of the lake, the Jordan River flows all the way down into the Dead Sea. And it hits the Dead Sea. That's where it stops. There's no outlet. That's why they call it the Dead Sea, because it takes in, but it doesn't give out which is an analogy for us as Christians. When we take in and don't give out, we become like the Dead Sea. We need to be 
kind of recipients and then let it flow out to other people. But he's up in the area of Galilee and he's on the west side, probably around the area mentioned here is Tiberias. And then he gets in a boat and he cuts across the top north corner of uh, the Sea of Galilee over to the eastern side around Bethsaida. And uh, there up in the hills above the eastern shore of Galilee is where this miracle took place, verse 1. And it tells us that a great multitude followed him. Now, Jesus is in the middle of his Galilean ministry. He's healing people. And so literally thousands of people are following him, thronging him, crowding him, reaching out to him. Everywhere he went, people wanted to be healed. He'd wake up in the morning and people are right there wanting to be healed. He had no time for himself. And it's believed, and again, I think rightfully so, by a comparison of the Synoptic Gospels, that Jesus went across the lake to get away from the crowds. That he was actually going there maybe for a little R&R, &R, a little private time with his disciples, and he just wanted to get away with them, but to no avail because the multitudes, verse 2, followed him. Now, Jesus went by boat, but the Scripture indicates that the crowds saw him take off across the lake, and they walked around the north part of the lake. So probably about a 10-mile journey. So they were booking. They put on their PF flyers, and they were just, Wah! and they just took off around. They didn't have PF flyers in those days. They actually had van tennis shoes in those days. So forgive me. I didn't. I shouldn't make jokes of the Scriptures, but they take off around the northern point of the Sea of Galilee. And again, the theory is, and I think it's a good one, that by the time they landed on the sea, the crowd had already skedaddled around the lake and they were like, hi, Jesus, how you doing? Long time no see. And he's like, oh, mom, put it in reverse. Let's get out of here, you know. But no, we're going to see that Jesus was moved with compassion and he ministered to them in their needs. So he goes uh, to the other side of the lake to get away from the crowd, but the crowd chases him around in verse 2. But he tells us why they did it, because they saw his miracles, which he did on those who were diseased. So they, 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 they were following him because he was a miracle worker. He can heal the sick, he can raise the dead, he can cleanse the lepers. He can do all these marvelous things, and it was so wonderful, so the crowds... And the people, so you see the place was Galilee, and you see the people, the multitudes who were following him, and he was going there to get away, but the crowds pursued him and followed him because they were following his miracles, which is in a way a kind of a shallow reason to follow him. They fully didn't understand that he was the Son of God and even the Messiah who would come to deliver them from their sins. But notice verse 3, Jesus went into a mountain. So he does get off the boat, goes up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And it says there that the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. So it doesn't tell us that it was actually Passover time, but it was that period. It was close to the time of the Passover, and the Passover is in the early spring. So one year from this, Jesus would die on the cross as that Passover lamb for the sins of the world. We're going to see later that they were told to sit down and there was green grass in that place. So it was obviously springtime. Now, Jesus was trying to get away from the crowd, but they followed him. So the next movement of our story is how does Jesus respond? What does Jesus do with this multitude during this time when he really wanted to get away? It's interesting that the disciples, and a little insight from the other Gospels, it's not here in this John's account. Mark 6, verse 36, they actually told Jesus, we need to send the people away so that they can go to the villages and the towns and back home to buy some food that they might eat. Now, if they took a 10-mile journey around the north side of Galilee, they, they had a long way to go. There was no 
you know, in and out burgers. There was no 7-Elevens. There was no stop and goes. There was no place to get food. They didn't have any food. So send them back. Get rid of them. Isn't it interesting? A lot of times when you're facing a problem, we want God to just send it away. We want God to take it away. We want God to remove the problem. But we move from the context and the setting and the miracle in verses 1 to 4 to the first little part of verse 5 to see Jesus' response and his compassion. So when Jesus, verse 5, lifted up his eyes, and what an awesome thought that Jesus, those beautiful eyes full of love and care and concern, he saw the great company come to him that he said to Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? But I want you to just note the first part of verse 5. He saw the great company that came to him. And write down Mark chapter 6, verse 34, where it tells us there that Jesus was moved with compassion because they, the people, were sheep not having a shepherd. So the disciples saw Jesus as a problem to get rid of. Jesus saw them as sheep to feed and to care for. We learn a lot about a shepherd's heart and true ministry. Instead of wanting to get rid of the people, Jesus says, no, you feed them. And I've always taken note of that as a pastor, that God loves His people and He wants to feed His people. And He wants us, the under-shepherds, and you and I as well, to love God's people and to be His instrument of blessing and feeding and encouraging and equipping others. So instead of just sending the people away when He was tired, He tells His disciples, no, we need to feed them. We need to minister to them. The disciples saw the crowd, as I said, as a problem. Jesus saw them as people who needed to be cared for. I love 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. You ought to write that down. It's a great cross-reference for this story. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, casting all your, what? Your care upon Him, Jesus, because He, what? He cares for you. You know, we hear so much about the great love of God, the wonderful love of God, and it's true that God loves us. But I love that verse because it tells us it's just that God cares about you. Because you get those times when you think, does anyone really even care about me? Everybody just wants from me. Everybody wants to get from me. Does, does anybody really care about me as an individual or as a person? And the truth is, yes, there's one tonight who cares for you. If you don't get anything else out of this study tonight from this point on, write down that passage, 1 Peter 5, 7, and write down, He cares for me. He cares about you. He cares about your weaknesses. He cares about your fears. He cares about your disappointments. He cares about your problems. He cares about your struggle. He cares about your marriage. He cares about your children. He cares about your grandchildren. He cares about you. And all the things that weight us down, we need to learn to cast them upon the Lord. The psalmist says, roll thy burden upon the Lord and He will sustain thee. I love that. And that word casting, by the way, in that Peter passage, in the Greek it would be once and for all. It was used of casting a net, a fishing net on the Sea of Galilee. Just throw your burden on God and leave it there. Don't carry your burden. So often we tell God about our problems, but we continue to carry them rather than roll them upon the Lord and let the Lord sustain us and take care of us. Now we move to the third section of our story, and this is the heart of the story and the miracle. This is the characters of the miracle. So we have the context, verses 1 to 4. Verse 5, we have the compassion that Jesus showed the multitudes. And then verses 5, the end of verse 5, all the way down to verse 14, we're going to see the story of the individuals around the miracles. Verse 5, when Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw the company come, and he said unto Philip, and this is awesome, Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now no, notice that Jesus is asking Philip a question. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, asking someone a question. You know, can you imagine you're hanging out with Jesus 
He's God in the flesh and He turns to you and asks you a question. <laughs> Why are you asking me? You are like the, the incarnate Word. You're, 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 you're the Son of God. Why would you ask me a question? But the Bible tells us why he asked Philip the question, verse 6. This he said to prove him, or the word would be test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. In other words, Jesus is messing with him a little bit. He knows what he's going to do. He just wants to put Philip to the test. And I believe that God many times will test us and try our faith to see if we will trust him. So he did this to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. But Philip answered him and said, now you don't see it in this portion of Scripture here between verse 6 and verse 7, but there's actually a several hour gap between these verses. The Jesus probably asked early on, Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? And he kind of left it for a while and Philip got his calculator out and he started trying to figure it out. Well, how much do we need to buy for these counting them, you know? And hey, Andrew, go count everybody. I need, to, I need the information here. And a- after several hours, he finally came back to the Lord and said, Lord, 200 penny worth. Now, the word penny worth in the, in the Greek is the word denarii. We get our word denarii. And denarii was a common laborer's day's wage. So whatever a common laborer would work for one day, that was a denarii. So 200 denarii wouldn't be enough to buy for every one of these people that everyone would have sufficient. And notice the word sufficient there. 200 denarii of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have just a little. Now, why did Jesus ask Philip the question? Let me tell you not why he didn't ask him a question. He didn't ask him a question because he needed information. Whenever Jesus asks questions, it's not because he needs information. He wants us to learn a lesson. He wants our faith to be tested. So Jesus was testing him, for he knew what he would do. Now, write this down. God will test your faith. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. God will test and God will try your faith. During the gold rush here in California, I wasn't around at that time, but back in the gold rush days when they would mine the gold out of the ground, sometimes they would find gold, but they didn't really know if it was any value until they would go to the assessor's office and they would have it tested and they would have it weighed and they would find out whether it was genuine or authentic and what it was valued at. So we don't really know what our faith is worth until it's been put to the test, until it's been tried and tested. When they construct a new bridge over a river, no one knows what it will hold until they drive over it. So God doesn't test us to destroy us. He tests us to prove us. And I don't have any doubt, but what some of you tonight are here, you've been tested lately. Maybe temptations have been allowed by God to test your faith that you'll stand strong. Maybe some disappointments have come into your life. They're tests for your faith. They're food for your faith. That you will trust Him. Maybe some horrible adversity. Maybe some bereavement or loss. Or some pain. Some breakup of a relationship. Maybe physical sickness. And God is allowing that in your life to test your faith. Will you trust Him? Will you look to Him? Will you hope in Him? Or will you resort to your own resources and turn away from Him? So take note of that, that the Lord was putting Philip's faith to the test. And then Philip says 200 denarii is not sufficient. Now there's a, there's a real lesson here. Philip is being tested in the area of his faith, and he looks to his own resources and the resources of the disciples. And then he concludes, we do not have sufficient funds to take care of the problem. You know, isn't it funny that sometimes we think money is the solution to our problems? Some of you are here tonight thinking, if I could just win the lottery, 
All my problems would be over. No, your problems would just begin. You'd have to figure out what to do with all that money. Say, I can't handle that kind of a problem. But it really can be a problem. It can ruin your life. Money is not the issue. Well, if I just knew the right people, that's not the issue. If I just had the right content, I've had a better job, or if I had this or I had that. And we look to our own resources. And when we're looking at our own resources, we always come to the same conclusion Philip does. It is not sufficient. It is not what we need. When we look to the Lord, we realize He is sufficient. He has the adequacy to meet the need. So you turn your eyes off of yourself and your own resources, and you look to the Lord to meet those needs. So he looked at his own human resources. He forgot Christ's divine resources. He saw only his insufficiency, and he forgot Christ's all sufficiency. He calculated, but he calculated without Christ as part of the equation. You know, whenever you face a problem, whenever you face a difficulty, the first direction your mind and heart should turn is to God. And realize that God is able and God is capable and you should trust Him. You should, he should have looked to Jesus and realized, Lord, You are the Master of all things. You're the Creator of the universe. This 200 denarii is not sufficient, but You are sufficient to meet our need. And He should have saw that Jesus could meet their need. And how often we do the very same thing. Maybe it's a spiritual need. Maybe it's an emotional need. Maybe it's a physical need. I love 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul had a thorn in his flesh. A messenger of Satan that was allowed to buffet him. To keep him humble. And he prayed three times and asked God to take it away. And God said, no, I won't take it away. But my grace will be, and here's the word, sufficient for you. And my strength will be made perfect in your what? Not your strength, your weakness. So it really has nothing to do with our resources or our ability or our strength. It's all about His ability and His strength and His resources. And God takes our weaknesses and He uses them to give us an experience of His sufficiency and His adequacy. There's a beautiful poem that says, when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we've reached the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit, His grace has no measure, His power no boundary, known unto men, for out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. The problem is we look for our own strength and we faint. We look at our own resources and we grow discouraged. We look at our own abilities and we think that we can't do what God's called us to do. But God is our strength and God is our sufficiency. Roy Lauren says, faith does not minimize difficulties. It maximizes God. We need to remember that God has unlimited power and unlimited resources. Now, there's a second individual in our story, and his name is Andrew. I want you to notice it there in verses 8 and 9. One of the disciples named Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto Jesus, there's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fish. But then he dismisses them immediately by saying, but what are they among so many? Now, he has a little bit of a glimmer of faith because he says, well, there are this one little lad here and he's got a few loaves of bread and he's got a few fish. But then immediately he just goes, ah, man, but no way is it going to work. It's just not going to happen. Look at this great multitude. And he's looking at these five little loaves of bread and these two little fish. And he looks at 5,000 men. Now, we don't know the total number, but for sure there were women there and there were children there. So there could have been easily 10,000, 15,000, some say 20,000 people to feed. That's a big crowd 
out in the wilderness. And so Philip says, all we got is five little loaves of bread. Now, these little loaves of bread, this, this bread was not a big kind of Weber's loaf, you know, that you get at Alpha Beta or Seder Brothers. They were barley loaves, little kind of hard, flat pieces, just small, about the side of a baseball, little pieces of barley bread. And by the way, barley was the bread for the poor folk. It was the bread of the peasants. It was the common, despised bread. So not only is it only five pieces, it's barley. And the two fish there, they weren't giant, you know, bluefin, a tuna, you know, oh, we've got two big giant fish. They were, they were like little sardines. They literally were two little tiny, like sardine-sized fish. And they would be chopped up and put on the barley. The barley was so bad, you had to put a sardine on it to eat it, you know. <laughs> I would just stick to the barley because I, I'm not a fish eater. I don't like to smell them. I don't like to taste them. I don't like to eat them. I like to let them swim in the water and just, you know, have fun. But this guy had these little things. Now, a lot of interest in this little boy. When I get to heaven, I can't wait to find him. And what I want to know is, did you give your lunch voluntarily or did Andrew <laughs> grab you by the ear and bring you hollering and screaming, I got this little kid and he's going to have to share his lunch with us. Uh, my theory is that he gave it voluntarily. I, I, I don't think the disciples nor Jesus would force this lad to share his lunch. But Simon Peter's Brother Andrew is known as the friendly apostle because wherever he appears in the Bible, he's always bringing people to Jesus. So how he found him, I, I don't know, but he found this little lad. But it's interesting that often Satan wants us to believe that our gifts and our abilities are insufficient and we feel that we don't have the ability to serve God. I've been in full-time ministry for a long time. And there's always that sense of inadequacy and inability and insufficiency. And it's a dangerous thing when we think that, wow, I have the ability, I have the gifts, I know what I'm doing. Because the Bible says the proud God knows far off. One of the reasons Paul had a thorn in his flesh was to keep him humble. Well, why did God want to keep him humble? To keep him usable. He'd been caught up into heaven and seen things that were unspeakable. And so his paradise experience could have given him pride. So God gave him pain. I am convinced that God allows pain in our life to keep us humble and broken and dependent upon him. That God loves us too much to let us just go our own way. So he pulls the rug out, spiritually speaking, from us, or he allows some adversity or some sickness or some difficulty or some financial reverses to come into our life to teach us, Lord, I need you. Lord, give me strength. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, help me. Lord, deliver me in this situation. It's a blessed thing to realize your inadequacy, but to not grow discouraged, but to focus on God and to be courageous and strong, trusting in God, that God hears and God cares and God answers prayer. And whatever problem you're facing and you don't have the resources or you don't have the ability or you don't know how you're going to make it through another day, God loves you, God cares about you, and God has the sufficient grace. His strength will be made perfect in your weakness. But you must trust Him by faith. You must Look to Him by faith. As I pointed out, these barley loaves were the bread of the peasants. They were cheap and common everyday bread. The bread of the poor folks. But it reminds us how God uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. God used Gideon's pitcher. God used David's sling and a stone. God used Moses' rod. God used a donkey to speak to Balaam, and there's hope for you and I. Whenever I read the story of Balaam, God can speak through a donkey, God can speak through me. 
God can speak through you. There's hope for us. So maybe all you have is uh, something simple and humble, a broken heart. Give it to God and let God do what He will. Years ago, D.L. Moody, the great American evangelist, heard someone say that the world has yet to see what God will do with a man who's fully surrendered to Him. And Dwight Lehman Moody said, by the grace of God, I will be that man. And he surrendered his life to God and God used him in such a marvelous and wonderful and powerful way. Now, there are some silly ideas about this miracle, and I won't spend any time on them, but William Barclay in his commentary, which can be valuable, but William Barclay tries to explain away the miracles of the Bible, which is pretty sad. He says, this is not a miracle of multiplying bread and fish. This is a miracle of God touching people's hearts with sympathy and getting them to share their lunch. Then in reality, the little boy wasn't the only one in the crowd that had a lunch that day. That everyone else had their lunch, but they thought they might be the only one with the lunch, so they had it up their sleeves. You know, the oriental robes have the big sleeves, so he stuck it up his sleeve. And when they saw this little boy give up his lunch and his generosity, it touched their hearts, so they reached in their sleeve and they took out their food and they all ate. Now, that's not what the Bible says. I hardly think that the people who saw the miracle would have said, truly, this is that prophet that should come, and they realized that Jesus was the Messiah. I think that Jesus performed a miracle, and the Bible is very clear that it's a miracle of God's miraculous power to multiply. Now, when Jesus healed blinded eyes, diseased eyes, lame legs, he, he, he was healing eyes that were already there, legs that were already there. But when he healed, when he multiplied the bread, he took bread and loaves and he multiplied them. They, they, they didn't exist and he multiplied them and there's even going to be abundance left over. So it's a miracle of his creative power and his omnipotence as well as his compassion and that he satisfies as well the hungry heart. But we learn the lesson that little is much in the hands of Jesus. So the last individual in the story is Jesus, verse 10 to 14. Jesus said, make the men sit down. In Luke chapter 9, verse 14, it says they were put in groups of 50. So make them all sit down. They were put in groups of 50. And there was much grass, little information there when they sat down. So there was the supply, verse 9, of the barley loaves and the few fish. And then there's the sitting on the grass. Make them sit down. So the men sit down in number about 5,000. And then I love it. Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. And the disciples to them that were sat down. And likewise of the fish as much as they would. And they were filled. The Greek word is they were glutted. They were stuffed. And he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together. They filled twelve baskets with fragments of the barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then these men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did. So it was definitely a miracle of multiplying these bread and this fish. They said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. So the bread and the loaves were placed in Jesus' hands. What a lesson for us. Take your problem to the Lord and what? Put it in His hands. Amen? Put it in His hands. Take your hands off. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. You know that statement in the Hebrew, be still and know that I am God, literally means take your hands off. Take your hands off. You know, most of the time people come to me with a problem and they want counsel or easy solution, how to remedy the problem. You know what the answer to their problem is? Trust the Lord. Just trust the Lord. You have to pray. You can't, you can't fix it. 
You can't remedy it. You just have to trust God. Well, isn't there something I can do? Can I get him in a headlock and punch him and make him get saved and make him fix up to straighten up their life? Can, can I do anything to get my teenager straightened out or my husband saved? No, you have to pray and trust the Lord. Put it in God's hands. So they took the bread, they took the loaves, and they put it in God's hands. We see here what we need to do when we're facing an overwhelming problem. Those hands that made the worlds and know that little is much when it's put in the hands of Jesus. Now the miracle took place in the hands of the Savior, not in the hands of the disciples. I want you to know what Jesus did. Look at verse 11. He gave thanks. So we ought to give thanks when we're facing a problem. We ought to give thanks to the Lord. How amazing that Jesus attempted to give thanks at that moment. We're going to give thanks tonight as we eat the bread and drink the cup. He accepts what was given to him and is thankful for it. And then he broke the bread. Now, it's not recorded in John's Gospel, but the other Gospels tell us he broke the bread. So many times we give our lives to God, he breaks us, and then he multiplies us. And the third step is he had distributed it, verse 11. So he gave thanks for it, he broke it, and then he distributed it. I believe that our lives have to be broken to be a blessing. It's called the blessing of brokenness. And so God breaks us so that our lives would flow with a fragrance. You know, if you take a rose, it'll mess up the rose, but if you want to really smell the fragrance of a rose, you crush it. And you know what God many times does with our lives? so that His fragrance flows from us, He crushes the rose. So that its fragrance flows out. So it's out of the broken life that blessings come. Now Jesus blesses it, breaks it, and distributes it. Now the disciples were told to pass out the bread and pass out the fish. And at this point, they do act in obedience. I'm wondering what's going through their minds. Are you serious? There's, you know, way over 5,000 people here. We got five little pieces of bread and two little sardines, and you hand it to us, and you expect us to pass it out to meet the needs of this hungry crowd. But what God wants us to do is not question, but obey. He wants us to just take a step of obedience. Lord, I don't know how this is going to work, I don't know what's going to happen. But they took that step of obedience and God intervened and did an awesome miracle. So they passed out and it says they gave them all that they can handle. Verse 11. And they were filled. And he said unto his disciples, then gather up the fragments that remain. So they served them. And we see God's power. Now, as they kept breaking it and handing it and breaking it and handing it out, breaking it in hand. It just kept coming and kept multiplying and kept multiplying and kept multiplying. And I wonder how far into the distribution did the disciples start to freak out? Like, whoa! You know, they're looking at each other like, this is awesome! What an awesome thing that is when God performs a miracle when we step out in faith and we see that He has sufficient for all that we need. And they were satisfied. They were filled. Jesus satisfies the hungry heart. And He does have power because they gathered, verse 13, 12 baskets with the fragments. And that word baskets is actually a large basket, big enough for a man to climb into. It's the same Greek word used for the basket that Saul was lowered down the wall of Damascus after his conversion when he escaped the enemies who were going to try to get him. So it was a large basket, and this basket is full of the fragments. So ladies, if your husband ever complains about leftovers, tell him Jesus did it. Let's gather up the food, that nothing be lost, so we can eat it another day. So they gather up the fragments of the five barley loaves that remained over and above unto them that had been eaten. Now notice the response in closing, verse 14, then those men, when they had seen the miracle, the miracle, this was a miracle, 
what only God could do, that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet, that should come. Now, what did they mean by that statement, that prophet, that should come? It takes us back to Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, where Moses actually predicted that the Lord would raise up unto you a prophet like unto me, and unto him shall you hear. So actually the Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 is a prediction of Messiah from Moses, that a prophet like me, and it's interesting, a prophet like me. What did God do through the ministry of Moses in the wilderness with the children of Israel? He brought manna. It's interesting that in verse 31 of this same chapter, when Jesus goes into his discourse about being the bread of God from heaven, it says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, they said. It is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're actually saying, Could you multiply some more bread? They followed them around wanting to eat. It's interesting that manna means what is it? And it was in the morning they would get up and gather the manna, and they didn't really know what it was, so they called it, What is it? And for 40 years they ate, What is it? They're like little, 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 little wafers that say taste like honey, and it must have been awesome, and they used it in so many ways, I'm sure. But God is a great provider. But they were filled, verse 12, and they were satisfied with all the provision that God had. Jesus Christ is sufficient for every problem that you face. Amen? Spiritual, physical, financial, emotional. Maybe you're depressed tonight. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're facing some difficulty that you don't have the resources to overcome. Jesus Christ has the sufficiency to meet every need. So you may be looking at your bank account. You may be looking at your strength. You may be looking at your own resources in light of the problem. Get your eyes off the problem. Get your eyes on the person of Jesus Christ. He is sufficient for every need. In verse 35, I want to close with that. We'll get it in a couple of weeks. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, and he that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never what? Thirst. So you believe on Jesus, and you will never, you come to Jesus, excuse me, and you will never hunger. You believe on Jesus, and you will never, ever be thirsty. Let's pray.